everyone, and welcome to Sample Size. The only news podcast that cares about science. I'm your host, Samantha Spears. And I'm your other host, Wildcard Cameron. And before we start, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been sharing and subscribing and getting this podcast around. Sam, I know that you've been telling me about all the like the crazy number of downloads and stuff we've been getting lately. It's just nice to know <laughs> that people are sharing. If you haven't subscribed and you're listening to this, please consider. Thanks, everyone. We just want to say that around the holiday times. Lots of times to share cool advice. But more importantly, you, Sam, have some very interesting news you need to share with me and our many, many listeners that I just gave a total awesome shout out to because they're great. What's up with the news? Yes, we are going to talk about Parlor. Like the front room of a house? <laughs> like what the old timey people call the front room of a house? No, not that. Recently, there have been several news stories about a new social media app called Parler that got a surge in downloads after the U.S. presidential election. So Why? <laughs> well, that's what we're going to talk about today. This is dumb of me to ask. <laughs> so I thought today we would go over what is Parler, why are people joining it, mm -hmm. and just in general, should there be censorship on the internet? Ooh, oh, okay. Now you've given me a taste of what's going to happen. Okay. All right. Let's get into this. What is it? All right. First up, what is Parler? People have probably been hearing this around, floating around social media, things like Twitter. And Parler, it's actually a Twitter-like social media app that was launched back in 2018 by CEO John Mates. And it's touted as a social media app dedicated to free speech that does not censor or fact check users. And that is famously said by the CEO, if you can say it on the street of New York, you can say it on Parler. I already hate that description. Also, it sounds like the reverse Quibi. <laughs> the reverse Quibi? I swear also. to God, Quibi is like a multi-million dollar joke. It was just created. As, well, OK, first of all, Quibi was a place that you could only say what they let you say on Quibi because they went out of their way to make content for it. Whereas here, the idea sounds like you're just going to let anyone say anything they want. In that aspect, yes. I guess it is a reverse quibby. It also sounds like a moderately out-of-touch multimillionaire was responsible for forcing this down our throats. <laughs> eh, that's a possibility. All right. I can't wait to see parlor ads take up all of the YouTube advertising space. Let's go. <laughs> all right. And I would like to say I have not personally downloaded and explored this new app or social media platform, but I did learn some about its interface from The Guardian. So... First, as I said, Twitter-like, it's basically a new kind of Twitter. Users have to seek out accounts they want to follow, and users can post text or images, which others can then comment on, give a vote of approval, or an echo, which is its version of a retweet. And according to the company, the general content rules are, one, do not post anything unlawful, and two, no spam. Those first two things already sound like they're going to push up real hard against their you-can-say-whatever-you-want thing. Yeah, in what way? All right, well, for one thing, and this will shock many people, there's a lot of things you can say on the streets in New York that you probably just should never say in general, like, <laughs> period, but even more so on the internet because the internet has really, really strict guidelines based on which jurisdiction you're in. And I know we're going to get there later, but I just want to say, like, those terms of service and all that stuff is already pushing up against their mission. Yes. Remind me, we're going to go right back to that discussion later. So... First, let's just talk about why are people actually joining this app? What's the purpose of it? Why is this getting attention? Well, social media companies like Twitter and Facebook have long been criticized for how they monitor content. And in recent years, some conservatives and far-right individuals have criticized the companies for censoring content, particularly for doing things like tagging content as misinformation or removing content that promotes violence or hate speech. So Parler is seen as an alternative where certain content can be spread without any kind of censorship. And so I mentioned at the top of the episode that there was a surge in downloads after the presidential election. That was because Twitter and Facebook increased content monitoring during the election to combat misinformation. For example, tagging posts that mentioned mail-in voter fraud, that there had been no evidence of voter fraud. All right. So what I just heard was the content that most of the internet genuinely doesn't like to engage with and also is, let's be honest, it's such a pain that most of the companies that actually run social media sites decided was too bad because it was going to ruin their own 
subscriber base is the only real selling point of this new platform. That's that's what I just heard. A bit. Yeah, because that's kind of the audience it's gaining. Like a number of high profile conservatives are on Parler. Let me go through this list. I don't know if I want you to. <laughs> This includes Cinder Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Candace Owens, Fox News hosts Maria Bartomoro. I think I said that right. Mm. Bartomoro. I'm sorry. Eric and Laura Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and Laura Loomer, who, fun fact about Laura Loomer, has apparently been banned from not only Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, but also Uber and Lyft. That makes sense. I don't know how. I didn't look that up any further. I'm just imagining a lot of one-star reviews with lots of racial slurs. Oh my God, no. I just, how do you get banned from Uber and Lyft? I just don't understand that. That's not for this podcast. Also, this seems like an upsetting trend in that it sounds like we're putting people with the most fringe opinions in the same place, building a really obnoxious echo chamber where most of the people who are there are going to be operating with this as the baseline. You haven't named a single person that wasn't considered to have moderately extreme views during the election, if not worse. And now they're all in one place. Yes. Before we kind of dive into that other background about this new app, recently CEO John Mates confirmed to The Wall Street Journal that Rebecca Mercer has been one of the top investors in Parler since 2018. And if you don't know who the Mercer family is, Rebecca Mercer and her hedge fund billionaire father Robert Mercer have funded several conservative causes including backing Trump in 2016, donating to Breitbart News, and donating to former White House strategist Steve Bannon. And by donate, I mean donate a lot of money, like around $25 million to conservative candidates and causes in 2016 alone. And something, Cameron, you will probably react to, Rebecca and Robert Mercer also own part of Cambridge Analytica, the data mining firm that played a role in the 2016 presidential election. Wait, that sounds like a real circle of a pay scheme. Like you paid Donald Trump to pay you to do analytics for you. That's what I just heard. They paid Donald Trump to use Cambridge Analytica. Like you paid yourself. In a way, yes. But would you like to talk about Cambridge Analytica real quick? No, I'm still stuck on this donation tax scheme they just came <laughs> up with. I'm sorry. Okay. Cambridge Analytica, for anyone who doesn't know, they were an analytics company. They got in a lot of hot water for using – they basically collected and used Facebook data in a way that whether or not you think it should have been allowed to be used that way – a lot of individual users of Facebook did not like it. Basically, you were able to take quizzes, do any number of things, and as a result, not only was your data collected, your friend's data was also collected. They were getting lots and lots of data and using it to micro-target individuals with campaign ads for Donald Trump. And digital advertising is not new, but this overreach in the way the data was used – pointed to glaring problems not just with Facebook and its own data use practices, but also how analytics companies like Cambridge Analytica could leverage that data. Yes. And so when I found out this news of Rebecca Mercer actually funding Parler, my instant thought was, huh, I wonder if some of those similar tactics are going to be used on Parler's user base. And let's be honest, a social media company, most big companies that use their products for free, Google, Facebook, YouTube mm -hmm. is also Google. Twitter. <laughs> they make a lot of money off of either you paying to promote your content on their site or people advertising on that site. So it's safe to say if you're making a social media app that is like Twitter, it's going to have an advertisement model like Twitter. Mm. That's just built into the entire recipe. I gotcha. Yeah. Also, they paid themselves money <laughs> and wrote it off as a donation. The math is very clear. <laughs> All right. Well, now that we've talked about why people are starting to join this app, let's actually talk about does Parler actually censor or not? So people have already started to question Parler's terms of service. For example, one item says users can be billed for any losses or damages attributed to what they post on Parler. And another item says Parler may remove any content and terminate your access to the services at any time for any reason. And I mentioned already the content rules about nothing unlawful and no spam, but the CEO also posted in July other rules, including no pics of fecal matter, no obscene usernames, and no pornography. Man, you really let me down here. <laughs> okay. And content can still be removed if it violates one of Parler's policies. And I'll just go through quickly what that removal process is like. Apparently, 
Reported content gets sent to a jury portal for review by a group of volunteer verified parlayers who participate in regular training. <laughs> and users are warned by a notification that they are hit with a violation point and 20 points in 90 days means the user will be removed from the platform. What is this, someone's driver's license? I guess. Do they, you get suspended? Are they going to possess your car? I <laughs> You know, honestly, I don't really know much of how banning systems work on like Twitter, Facebook or anything. So I can't I don't have much of a comparison. All right. So to be fair, let's do a quick comparison here. Typical social media platforms, I guess, for the purposes of understanding how banning relates to what the purpose of the platform is, you can think of social media as a megaphone with very perverse incentives. The goal of the megaphone is to amplify your voice so you can reach people you wouldn't normally reach. Except instead of just yelling loudly on a street corner at all the people going to Olive Garden, you're actually yelling loudly at people across a large demographic section of the internet about your Olive Garden coupons. Okay. So that that's fundamentally what it is. And when you violate their terms of service, it's basically like your friend saying, I'm not going to let you borrow my megaphone anymore because I don't like what you're doing. And Parler's trying to say... I'm giving you a warning. They're trying to be, I think, something that most of us who've been on the awkward side of like shadow ban systems or have done any, even the like smallest amount of research into not just like like banning. People think you have to do something truly obscene to Mm -hmm. get banned on a platform. Lots of people get their Facebook accounts deactivated just because they changed their name. Especially this is a problem in the LGBTQ community because they'll change their name because they've chosen a new identity. And Facebook's like, nope. No. And you will suddenly not be able to access all the stuff you put on Facebook. And it's a very opaque system because a multi-billion dollar company is dictating how you get to talk on their platform. So I I get it. I really do understand the philosophical reasons you would want a place where you could be vocal. Mm -hmm. What I don't like is the kind of audience they're trying to attract. And I think a big part of what you're getting at there is there are still rules to the internet that they have to abide by. Like you can't have child pornography on the internet is a fundamental fact that if you're found with child pornography, and this isn't like you went and like actively tried to find it. Like if for some reason you accidentally cache a web page that has it on your phone, that is all the justification they need to charge you with a child pornography offense. Is okay. like is very admirable how hard law enforcement in many countries, not just the US, is going after this problem of child sexualization online. And as a result, lots of websites have to go out of their way to show that not only are they avoiding any opportunity for this to happen, they're actively working with law enforcement and other local agencies to fight this. But that's just one example of a myriad of ways in which they're expected to protect not just the information of children, but other individuals. Now, I admit, Parler is rated M17+. I didn't know apps got video game ratings, but that makes sense. Wait, is that an actual like rating? Yeah. If you go in the Google Play Store and look up Parler, because I totally had to, it says <laughs> Mature 17 Plus, and that is User Interacts. That's just it. That's the only reason they gave it an M17 Plus is User Interactions. Huh. Well, now I'm they're, they're like, expecting some naughty stuff to I, go down. <laughs> I guess. Now, I'm curious, like, does Twitter and Facebook have the same rating system? I'm I didn't even know this was a thing. Teen. Let's go look at Twitter. T for T. <laughs> Twitter is also M17+. plus. Okay. All right. So that, so that tracks. This actually brings us into the awkward space of COPPA, which is the Child Online Privacy Protection Act, which protects yes. children up to a certain age. Child Online Privacy Protection Act focuses on protecting children under the age of 13. So if you're a teenager, if the word teen shows up in your age, you are probably not protected by COPPA. And as a result, you have less immediate expectations to privacy when you go on those platforms. But hmm. the point of COPPA is to say, first of all, lots of these platforms are rated T for teen and saying, like, children should not be here. Yeah. Children still get on those platforms. Of course. Yeah. It is foolish for YouTube to tell anyone that children are not a large part of where their ad revenue money goes. And they had to deal with that. They had to deal with COPPA going after YouTube because lots of content creators are creating even animated content for adults mm-hmm. that keeps getting served to kids because of YouTube's own algorithm. And those eyeballs watching those advertisements are making money for YouTube in a way that violated COPPA. So YouTube really went after their own content creators instead of just acknowledging the fact that they should have done a better job making a platform where children weren't actively being used as the target demographic for ads. Ah, you know, I think this is actually a great moment to segue into how censorship on the Internet works. And should that be a thing? Because what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that 
because of these rules to protect children from seeing things they're not supposed to see at such a young, impressionable age that there are these rules in place. If I may, yeah, there's a lot of rules that are based in laws that they can come from all sorts of places. It's not just protecting children. There are rules about like banking information, what kind of data you can collect, how long you can hold it for, why you can use it. Mm -hmm. If you look at anything that has to do with the GDPR and EU, there are a bunch of clauses that say unless you have a legal reason to collect and hold information, even if it is for a valid business use, you need to convey it and it cannot be indefinite. Like there are lots of privacy regulations that aren't U.S. centric that still affect how we do stuff in the U.S. I actually released a YouTube video about it. Maybe you want to check it out. Link in the description. <laughs> but the important thing here is that, yeah, there is a lot of rules that these organizations have to follow. And as a result, they need enforcement tools that allow them to do this, which is, I think, where you want to go with this. That is right. My point is because of these rules in place, it doesn't seem like it's possible to have an app or a website that is lawless in a way that like is the ideal like wild wild west version of no rules anything is possible because there has to be some kind of enforcement going on yeah and let's just go back to i hate to bring this up but the child pornography example if you are doing nothing to maintain your service and people are actively posting that type of content on your service you are complicit in that behavior. Even mm -hmm. if you never knew and never looked at it, if the law enforcement raids wherever your data center is and takes your hard drives and finds that content, you will go to jail and be charged to the fullest extent of that law because you did not do your due diligence to at least find and fight it. Yeah, and that makes sense to me for it to be that way because otherwise – you could have someone creating a site and it really just be for that purpose of this site's only going to be to share child pornography. And then they go, oh, but, you know, I'm not doing it. These other people are. So it's, I completely understand why that rule is like that. Yeah. And then there's other sorts of rules that have to do with – I mean, I know there's like 80 different podcasts and TV shows and YouTube channels and whatever. They're just about how Facebook has had a hell of a time dealing with their own content guidelines – because of cultural differences, the fact that they want to maintain their teen rating, but they're like – nudity in certain countries is not considered an adults-only thing. And so people on the Facebook platform will treat it as though they can post nudity there. I know this is a big thing in Africa where women use nudity as a form of protest. Yeah. And they will post it on Facebook, a teen platform that's not supposed to allow that kind of content. And so there's this constant friction between – the different audiences and Facebook itself, where Facebook is trying to create a universal doctrine for which their content policy can work and each region being like, that doesn't work for us. And so that is going to be a fundamental problem to any social media platform. But Parler is going out of their way to be like, we are the naughty platform, the super naughty even though Twitter's already rated M for Mature, so. Well, now let me bring up this point. Clearly, we've established there has to be some kind of rules on the internet whenever you create a site because there are federal laws and regulations on what you can do and say on the internet and what you're responsible for. But now let's go into misinformation specifically because that seems to be the pool for Parler is that we're not going to tag things as saying, oh, this is false or misleading. Oh, this has misinformation in it. Things like that. So now I want to pick your brain on that. Like, should there be a space for that on the Internet? Or is it kind of the responsibility of social media platforms to, I don't want to say police that, but monitor misinformation? I think curate might be the best term in terms of what they do and the outcomes. Curate. Okay. Yeah, and I would like to caveat everything that comes next by saying I am just a, a voice. Like this parlor is clearly not targeted at me. I've done lots of research and investigation into this area in terms of technology law and how it's used on these platforms. But at the end of the day, in terms of what you actually want to do on a website and why you go there, every website is kind of tailor-made for its own purpose. You're going to go to certain websites because you want certain naughty content. And you're going to go to other websites because you want certain nice content. And that's kind of the model. That's I just wanted to caveat all this by saying, like, if you disagree with me, that is a valid opinion. You are allowed to disagree with me. <laughs> at me if you really want. At Wildcard Cameron on social media. But what I'm trying to get at here is... When the internet was created, it was meant for, as a democratization of information. It was meant as a place where people could work to create and share meaningful data, originally research data that eventually expanded into creating forums for sharing your favorite memes 
or creating a place to look up the latest Star Wars trivia. It was a place that was intended to democratize not just how data is shared, but how we engage, where you didn't have to worry about just one big cable company having control over what kind of content you normally got to see or could seek out. Yeah. Over time, big companies have built themselves as that platform where instead of you suddenly having to be a whole website provider in order to share some special content or run your own blog, you could just go here and continuously share posts and engage with your friends. I mean, that's that's why social media worked in the first place. You wanted a place where you didn't need to have a engineer's understanding of how to run a website or you just didn't want to deal with WordPress and you could still go and actually engage with your friends online without actually having to go to their house or call them on the phone. It made sense. What's difficult to do though is in that space, we have given one platform the ability to amplify a voice in a way that even with traditional broadcast media could never have been done. Like if you run something on Fox News, it might go viral, but it's going viral on the internet. It's not going viral on Fox News. Your Fox News is not bleeding over into other countries. Yeah, or I mean even other news agencies like the yeah. ABC Nightly News doesn't have its reach as it did back in the day. Now it's only going to have that reach if it went viral, air quotes, on the internet. All this to say, it's logical that you would want a space where you can go after the content you're interested in. But at the end of the day, you have to really be thinking about what this content is. Like I personally am highly against misinformation. I think it's just counterproductive to allow a place that operates by a completely different set of rules dictate conversations that need to be based in hard facts and science. It's always going to be counterproductive because we need to all be playing from the same playbook here. We can't be disagreeing on fundamental facts to have those bigger conversations. And honestly, to be frank, that could be anything. That could be race. It could be science. It could be technology. It can be any number of things. It's hard to have a common understanding if you don't start from a common background. But the thing that's troubling about misinformation is that a lot of the times it comes with an agenda. Like people aren't going out of their way to discredit scientists unless those scientists are actively talking about something or trying to research something or finding something that goes against something that might affect their bottom line, which is something we've seen a lot in the previous presidential elections, not just in the United States, but across the planet. Yeah. When I think of the term misinformation, I think of a definition of information that was specifically spread by someone to manipulate the facts or to purposely spread out false claims for their own agenda. That's kind of my personal definition. I don't know if that's the actual definition. And I think sometimes when people hear the phrase misinformation, it can be confusing and you can go and you can expand that to just think, oh, if something's I don't know. Then it can get muddied and be like, oh, if you can't prove it by concrete facts or if you can't prove this and people need opinions, people should have their opinions and people should be able to share those opinions. But I do believe this is a personal opinion. I think when it comes to people purposely spreading something that's false in order for a specific agenda, that should be monitored. Yeah. And as part of this conversation, I would like to give a quick moment to actually describe the difference between misinformation and disinformation. So disinformation with a D is the intentional spreading of information that's incorrect, typically with some sort of specific agenda. Oh, so okay. when you hear misinformation in the media, it's often conflated with disinformation. But misinformation with an M is specifically the spread of incorrect information regardless of intent. So when your family member or you accidentally goes on the internet and shares a post that has information in it that is incorrect, it could be anything from just having a little bit of information that is wrong to being entirely false. That is misinformation. But if someone creates a piece of media with the express intent of misleading the public on something – like the fossil fuel industry did on misleading the actual effects of global warming for decades, that is disinformation. That is an active effort with a specific outcome. Huh. So would you say that disinformation can then easily become misinformation? Like it started as something that was purposeful and then people are spreading it unknowingly? Exactly. And that's why these platforms like Facebook and especially Twitter are going out of their way to highlight disinformation. They're saying this okay. piece of content was created, as far as we can tell, to give a false narrative that undermines a legitimate practice. Things around mail-in voting 
have been measured. People have done lots of research on the effects of mail-in voting. So when you go and say something contrary to that, and you are the president of the United States, mm -hmm. and it seems pretty clear that this action will lead to a negative outcome for your opponent, that can be interpreted as disinformation. And again, it comes back to that intent thing. Someone at Twitter had to make that call of, is the intent enough? Whereas when anyone retweets that information, regardless of their intent, it has now become misinformation. That is very good information. That is a nuance of the definitions I personally did not know. And I feel like a lot of our listeners probably did not know that. Yeah. And that's what now to bring it all back to the thing we're talking about. Yes. I think we're getting a little to the end of our conversation. Yes, we're getting to the end. Let's wrap up. <laughs> yeah. So Parler is not really setting itself up as a place where you can share anything. It's setting itself up as a place for disinformation where you can share content that is with a specific agenda that is they don't care how factually correct it is, but, but it still has to exist within the realm of acceptable behavior based on laws, not just within the United States, but anywhere Parler will operate. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of how Parler is being executed right now, the main audience it seems to have at the moment is really more far right extremist views and people of that mindset. So I think something we kind of hinted at is that what it's probably turning into at the moment is a bit of an echo chamber where people who have similar thoughts are able to find people with those exact same thoughts and just bounce those ideas back off each other, which I can't really say if that's a good or bad thing. That's kind of what the Internet was created for. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're on Facebook, Reddit, YouTube, Parler, anywhere. Always think about what kind of content you're consuming and who's giving it to you. Mm -hmm. It's okay to try to trivialize the fact that, oh, I trust NPR or I trust Vox or I trust a reputable news outlet of some sort enough that I can take most of the information that they're giving me at face value. But at the same time, it is always important to have that critical eye because it's not difficult for someone to take an image, put text over it, and then throw an NPR tag at the bottom of it, put it on Instagram and convince you that it's an NPR piece because you're just kind of blasting through Instagram. But if NPR is sharing it, maybe you take it a bit more seriously. Yeah. And I hope that that's what we've been doing with our podcast is actually taking a critical look at some of the popular news stories that come out because – us being of science and technology backgrounds, we have the tools to critically look at some of these stories and be like, all right, what's actually behind these things? What are the things that be going beyond what the viral headline is? You know, actually taking a critical eye at what information we're consuming. And after that self plug, if you've been enjoying our content, would like to see more or would like to suggest stuff that we should check out or talk about or whatever, find us on social media at Sample Size Show. Or leave a review telling us what a good job or a bad job, preferably good job we're doing. <laughs> yes. And as always, if you would like to find out more of what we talked about today, all of the links, all of my sources are in the show notes. And big shout out to Scott for editing our audio. Always doing a great job. Scott, you are the wind beneath our wings, our podcast wings. His information is also in the show notes. See you next time. Bye. Bye.